In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our beloved fathers, deacons, nuns, and faithfuls, both in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, may the Almighty God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one in nature and one in essence, bless you, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from the snares of the enemy, whether it be visible or invisible. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. So how are we? You sure? You love me? You sure? Are you sure? This is Middle Eastern way. Are you sure? We thank the Lord. Isn't Father Daniel and Father George, aren't they wonderful? Yes. I think I'm going to retire very soon because we have some wonderful fathers. What do you mean? No? Some of the choir members, they're saying, no, you're not going to retire. I'm old. The gospel of today. It is from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 46, which is the end of the chapter. So it is Matthew 21, verses 23 to 46, the end of chapter 21. The Lord Jesus enters the temple and then the chief priests and the elders of the people approached the Lord and said to him, by what authority are you doing this? Who gave you this authority? Now to understand what the chief priests and the elders of people, uh, to understand what they were saying to the Lord Jesus, we need to go back all the way to the beginning of chapter 21 where the Lord demands from two of his disciples to go to that opposite village of, to them where he was staying at the time that place was called Beth Page. Now Beth Page is a Hebrew Aramaic word meaning the house of figs. And that was the place where the Lord Jesus asked two of his disciples to bring that donkey and that colt that were tied together, bring him to him because he was just about to enter Jerusalem on what we celebrate in the church calendar as the Feast of Palm Sunday. And when he came to enter Jerusalem, that was Sunday. And as he entered Jerusalem sitting on the back of that mule, he went and entered the temple and he overthrew the tables of those who were buying and selling and those who were selling doves and said to them, my house, Jesus Christ, my house is called the house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. That was Sunday. After cleansing the temple from the buying and selling, he leaves Jerusalem and remains in a town called Bethania or Bethany. In English, it is pronounced Bethany, but in the original pronunciation, in the Hebrew Aramaic pronunciation, Bethania. Beth means house, Anya means agony. And this town, Bethania, the house of agony, was the town of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead after four days, and his sisters, Mary and Martha. They had a house in Bethania, the house of agony, or Bethany. The following day, he goes out and comes back to Jerusalem. On the way, he sees a fig tree. He comes looking, searching for fruits, and they, it was fruitless. And the Lord opens his holy mouth and says to that tree, 
there shall not be seen fruits in it forever it withered on the spot the disciples were blown away by this miracle they were shocked they said wow look at our master one word the the, the tree withered immediately the Lord said to them this surprised you and overwhelmed you if you pray with faith you can tell this mountain to be uplifted and be cast into the deep into the ocean it shall happen and the mountain here represents Satan if you pray with faith you can command Satan to be uprooted and be gone and it shall be given unto you now the following day Monday he enters the temple again the Lord enters the temple again which is the gospel of today when he entered the temple again the chief priests and the elders of the people approached the Lord and said yesterday by whose authority did you do that who gave you the authority to overthrow the tables and kick people out and say my house is the house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves we know and believe this temple is the temple of God are you God to claim it to be yours who gave you this authority so the Lord answers them so simplistically but so profoundly as always is God you cannot argue with God and you cannot with your own intellectual capacity try to corner God this is the dilemma of the human race when someone any human being and every human being when any one of us when any human does not have the love of God in their heart no matter what you do for them they will never appreciate it never no matter what you do for them even if you give them your life they will always try to find something to go against you and blame you for it amazing why because there is no true love of God embedded in them rooted deeply in their hearts it's absent so the Lord asked them this question he said if you can answer this question I will tell you by whose authority I did what I did yesterday on Sunday he said to them the baptism of John the Baptist where was it from was it from heaven or from men now the Lord corners them <laughs> they're in trouble so they went in that little corner over there and they started talking to each other what shall we answer now it is kind of difficult situation this man is too smart for us if we say it is from heaven ie God then he will say to us why didn't you believe in the baptism of John the Baptist and why didn't you receive baptism at his hand and if we say it is from men people hold him so highly as the prophet of God if we say his baptism is from men they will stone us to death the followers of John the Baptist will stone us to death so the best answer we will say to him we don't know <laughs> so they came thinking they're smart we don't know he said all right the Lord said since you don't know I'm not obligated to tell you where my authority is from I won't tell you either next time before you talk before you ask before you approach you better check your heart and see 
what kind of a condition it is approaching God are you coming to question his wisdom are you coming to put him to the test are you testing God what kind of an approach it is all dependent on your approach the the reply from God will be you approach him with false glory as if you are something special he will put you to shame you approach him by putting him on the spot and testing him he will put you to shame you approach him with humility he will glorify you he will exalt you he'll say you're my son yet I am full of sins from head to toe but he will come and say this is my son because you humbled yourself before the Lord but you see humility is not that it's not that easy it takes wisdom now the problem with the human race they're trying to figure out God by going to universities and studying and becoming something special oh I'm a professor in physics I'm a professor in whatever I, I have PhD in this listen all this gave you knowledge not wisdom get it you will never be able to humble yourself before the Almighty God until you receive wisdom guess what Notre Dame Oxford universities does not give you wisdom gives you knowledge the only one who gives wisdom is God Jesus Christ of Nazareth all glory to his holy and mighty name God is the only one now to receive wisdom you need to be humble and to be humble you need to know him and when you get to know him you need to love him because when you know him you love him when you love him you'll know how he operates you will humble yourself before him you see first get to know him in order to love him because when you love him you'll get to know him the first time you met a girl Habibi mm, I was out with me mates mate and then my eyes fell on this good-looking Sheila I saw a gazelle running right before me I said oh she broke my heart so you went and approached that gazelle you don't know her she doesn't know you so you introduced yourself you got to know the person when you came to know the person that was the only time you were able to begin loving the person because what leads to love is knowledge you've heard this so many times but when you came to love the person the love revealed more knowledge of the person and the more you came to know him through that love the more you began to know how to function and behave around the person hello hello if you as a man don't wash the dishes tonight you are in deep trouble brother so you better humble yourself and go into that kitchen and start washing the dishes because the president being the wife ordered you to do so and if you don't wash the dishes you will sleep outside in the gutter so you need to know God in order to love him in order to know him and then realize one thing about God he will never give you his wisdom unless you humble yourself before him wisdom it takes wisdom to manage life it takes knowledge to manage a small aspect of life yes this man is a professor at Sydney University and he is a very successful professor at Sydney University but he is a miserable failure as a husband and a father at home why because it takes wisdom to manage home but it takes knowledge to manage Sydney University anyone home so your PhD as a church leader gets you nowhere my dear friend 
If you think you can manage the church of the Lord and the flock of the Lord through your PhD, Satan is laughing at you. Satan is laughing at you. It takes humility to manage the, the Lord's flock, not knowledge, wisdom. Humility is wisdom. That's why there are so many church leaders who are very well educated, but miserably failures as church leaders. They lack wisdom. They have a lot of knowledge, but not much wisdom. They don't know Jesus because it takes wisdom to live with the Lord. It takes knowledge to talk about the Lord. It's so easy to talk about the Lord, but so difficult to live with the Lord. Because to live with Him means you need to deny yourself, give up on everything you love, and do everything. Talking to them like talking to kids at a kindergarten level. Yet they thought they are masters. Tell me, little boys, John the Baptist, where was his baptism from, heaven or earth? They couldn't even answer this question. Mm. That was Middle Eastern style. Mm -hmm. The Lord was literally saying to them, if you had believed in John the Baptist, you would have believed in me. You know why? Because John the Baptist is my ambassador. And when the king of a country sends his representative to another country, his representative, the ambassador, will speak, will do things according to the king's dictation. The ambassador does not speak of his own, does not do things out of his own mind. Everything he says, everything he does, he does it according to the king's directive. So that's why when John the Baptist came, baptizing people at the river Jordan, what did John the Baptist say to the people? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the Lord Jesus came, what did the Lord Jesus say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wow, where did John the Baptist get this message from? His king, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why he said, if you had believed in John the Baptist, you would have believed in me and where I got my authority from. I got it from myself because I am God revealed in the flesh. That's why I said to this temple being my house, not God's, mine, because I am God. This temple is mine. But you've turned it into a den of thieves. My house is called the house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. We've told you this before. Den of thieves has seven entries to it. Seven openings, seven gates. The den of thieves is the skull, the head of the human. The Lord is referring to your head and my head. Two eyes, two ears, two, the opening of the nos two nostrils and the mouth, two, two, two and one, seven. He said, the reason why you've turned my house, which is supposed to be the house of prayer into a den of thieves, because your eyes saw things God forbade. Your ears heard things God did not want you to hear. Your nose smelled things God said do not smell. And your mouth said words against God. This is why you allowed Satan to enter. Because a den is where lions live. Lions, vicious, furious lions. And what does the Holy Bible say about Satan? a roaring lion awaiting any one of us to be swallowed is that roaring lion so we allowed satan to enter our head 
and distorting the truth. That's why instead of being the house of the Lord as the house of prayer became a den of thieves, in the church, Christians went against one another and devoured one another. Wow. The Lord then says, this man had two sons. He came to the first one and said, go and work in my vineyard. He said, I'm not going. Isn't that the typical answer to mom and dad? <laughs> Children, <laughs> daughter, we're going to church. Mom, get a life. Son, come with me. Nah. Why? Because the magical word, because that is my definition of I don't want to talk to you. Short and sweet, because. So I said, son, go and work. He said, no. And then after a little while, that son, he felt bad. He said, you know what? That's not right to break my dad's word. He went eventually and worked in the vineyard. And then the father went to the other son, second one, and he said, go and work in my vineyard. He said, yes, sir. He was a good boy, but he never went. What a good boy. He played it very smart, didn't he? Of course, dad. And then behind dad's back, get alive, dad. You think I'm gonna go? I'm stupid to go, get alive. <laughs> Then the Lord asked him, he said, which of the two sons did the will of his dad? They said, the first one. He said, let me tell you this, you high priests, you chief priests and the elders of the people, tax collectors and harlots will have gone into the kingdom of God before you. You think you are the people of God? Tax collectors whom you despise, harlots whom you reject completely and you don't even greet them lest, lest you be defiled by them. He said they have gone into the kingdom of God before you. My advice to all of us, don't ever my son, don't ever my daughter think that you are someone more special than the other. Don't ever do that. Don't say, I have faith more than everyone else. I love the Lord more than everyone else. Be careful. If you start talking this way, Satan will come and make you fall. Simon said it at the Last Supper. If all of these, he didn't even say my brothers. <laughs> all of these, who are these Simon? They're your brothers. You've been living together for three years following Jesus Christ for three years and six, four months. You call him these? Ach, ouch. If all of these deny you, I will not deny you. Simon, you will deny me before a woman, not even a man or a Roman soldier. This woman will come and say, looks like you are one of the followers of Jesus Christ. He swore, he made an oath. I don't know this man. And in Matthew 16, 18, he said to him, you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. He acknowledged his divinity and humanity. Simon acknowledged the divinity and humanity of the Lord. And before a woman, he swore, I do not know this man. Oh. Why? Because he put himself before the Lord. If all these deny you, I will not deny you. I first, then you, Jesus. The Lord did not give him the keys. When did he give him the keys? After resurrection. Simon, come here. Do you love me? He said, I've learned my lesson, Lord. You know that I love you. Ah, good boy. Now that you've put your Lord before you 
And then you, now I'll give you the keys. I can trust you with the keys, Siminko. That's the, the spoiled name of Simon. I call him Siminko. I love him, huh? He's a beautiful saint. A mighty one. Don't ever put yourself before anyone, let alone God. When it comes to sin, put yourself number one. When it comes to sin, put yourself as number one. I am the only sinner. Everyone is a saint. And when it comes to love, put yourself the last one. Because if you put yourself number one in love, you'll expect everyone to do things for you. But if you put yourself last, you will do everything for everyone except you. So my daughter, if you're married, don't wait for your husband to come and say sorry. You go and say sorry. Embarrass him with love, baby. Now, until he comes and apologizes, he will never hear me. He will never see me. I will never talk to him. I'll cook nothing for him. He can go and buy frozen food. And you pick yourself and sleep in that on the other side of the house. Understand, don't ever come near me again. No, he made a mistake. It's okay. He's a man. That's all he knows. Men, men are simple. They're not sophisticated like you are. They're not as smart as you are. So men are very simple. Monotone. You are stereo. You've got too many wires coming through your head. He's got only one wire. Sometimes it blocks. Speaking of men... What is the difference between the man's brain and the woman's brain? This is all within our topic. The man's brain is made out of a lot of boxes. So is the woman's brain made out of a lot of boxes with a difference. The boxes in the man's brain are not connected to one another. The boxes on the other hand in the woman's brain, they are all interlocking, interwoven, interconnected. So one box is, <laughs> uh, and there's another difference. There is one box in the man's brain that is non-existent in the woman's brain. This box in the man's brain is called empty, nothing. <laughs> Have you seen your husband all of a sudden switched off and gone, became very quiet? Now he's using the empty box. And you being a perfectionist in perfect timing, you will come and nag, 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 nag when he is using the empty box. Shame on you. What are you doing? Playing PlayStation and I'm cooking and I'm cleaning and I'm washing. And he looks and he doesn't say a word. It makes you even more angry. Because that's his empty box. <laughs> There is nothing in it. That's why he'll give you nothing. He'll just look and turn around. So if he gets on your nerves, the best thing is for you, my darling, to go and say, honey, you've been spending too much time in that empty box of yours. 
Can I just let tell you one thing? I miss you, darling. I love you and I need you. Can you please come out of your empty box? He will jump out of that empty box and he will be the Mr. Super Duper for you and he'll come flying faster than... Uh, what's that guy that flies? Superman. <laughs> Superman. It's always beautiful when you say sorry. When you say hello. It's always beautiful when you humble yourself. Don't wait for the other. You do it. You start it. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Mine, yours, it doesn't matter. Just like that Indian guy went into this place to buy a drink. So the, the person there said, um, four dollars. He gave her three. She said, sir, the drink cost four dollars. You gave me three. Don't worry, keep it for you. She said, no, sir, you owe me a dollar. He said to her, doesn't matter, I owe you, you owe you, no problem. Keep it, please, keep it for you. Doesn't matter, I owe you, you owe me, doesn't matter. The dollar, keep it, please. So we need to be humble in order to live in love. To live in love. When we lack humility, life becomes extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. Because no matter what you do, you can never please that person who lacks humility. Very difficult to please. That's why the Lord Jesus, the first thing ever, he will demand, demand of us is humility. First thing, when we come to him the first time ever, he said you need to carry the cross. What is the cross? Humility. Humility, what is humility? Cross is death. What is death? I don't exist anymore. Why? Because now the one I love is my existence. I no longer live for me. I live for the one I love. That's humility. And we see that in marriage. Will you take her in good time, bad time, sickness and health? He said, yes. What a liar, man. And she said, yes, 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 yes. All she is thinking about honeymoon in Hawaii. After honeymoon, get a life. We need to live for the other, not for me. The Lord was questioned in a nasty way because those chief priests and the elders lacked humility. This is the problem of the church till this very day. And it is the problem of the entire human race. Why are we fighting? There is no humility. Why are we spying on one another? Because there is no humility. You know, God gave so much resources in this world that can feed not only 8 billion, it can feed 80 times 8 billion and it will never cease. Don't ever believe in what they say in these mainstream medias. It's all lies. These are the sons of the snake feeding you lies in order to distort the truth. God put enough resources to last you till the day he calls it the day. You can have not only one child, you can have as a family 20, 30 children and there will be plenty food for every single one because God is the almighty capable of doing anything and everything. With God, nothing runs out. His treasure house is always overflowing. But why are we fighting? Everybody's trying to run to be the superpower. To achieve what? Foolishness, blindness, ignorance. Absolute ignorance. 
But that's the world. But the church is not supposed to be like the world. Even in the, even in the church, we are running to try and be the ultimate, the best of the best. My throne is greater than yours. My position is higher than yours. My church is bigger than yours. My followers are more than yours. What is this? What is this? I don't want to keep you too long even though I always love to keep you as much as I can. The Lord said there was this man who was a landowner. He had a vineyard. He surrounded that vineyard with fence. And the New King James hedge, call it a fence. I like hedging. <laughs> with a fence. And then in that vineyard, he put a wine press. He built a wine press. And then he had a big tower built in that vineyard. And then he leased it to the vine dressers. After a little while, he sent his servants seeking fruits from the vineyard. Those vine dressers who leased that land from the owner, when they saw those servants of the owner, some of them they beat, they stoned, and some killed. The owner said, okay, I'll send again. And he sent more the next time. They did the same thing as they did to the first lot. Then the owner said, I will send them my own son. Lest they be ashamed or embarrassed of my son. When they saw the son, those vine dresses, they said, oh, he is the heir to everything. Let us kill him and let the inheritance be ours. So they took the son outside the vineyard and they killed him. The Lord said to these chief priests and the elders, he said, what will this vine vineyard's owner do to such vine dresses? They said, he will punish them severely and he will give the vineyard to others where they give him fruits in its season. He said, haven't you read the very stone, the chief stone, the very stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Haven't you read the very stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. That's why this vineyard will be taken away from you you chief priests and elders, and it will be given to a nation where they will give me the fruits in its season. They understood he was meaning them. They tried to stone him, but they were afraid people will go against them. This landowner is the Lord Jesus. Vineyard is his church. The fence around it is the law of Christ for his church. He gave law to his church, commandments to his church. This is the fence. As long as you abide by my word, church, the fence is strong. Enemy cannot enter or infiltrate. But the moment you start breaking my word and go against my word, my beloved church, the law of the, of the land, and you need to adhere to the government, and it is biblical, and they quote you verses, yes, and it is. There are verses from the Bible, but you see, they don't show you the other verses. Sneaky. So when the government comes and says, you need to accept this, are you going to accept it as a church? Then you're not a church, you're a den of thieves. See? Den of thieves. Oh, because if we don't accept them, then who's going to give us the grants? There's a lot of schools to be run. You see how you get caught? <laughs> Do you think the government is giving you money because they love you? No, because they want to control you. Oh, you want to build a school? Yeah, it's five million, ten million, six million. And we're going to give every student five thousand, ten thousand, twelve thousand plus take from the parents as well. 
But then again, see, we've been nice to you. So now we want you to uh, help us with the visa. What is he going to say? No? Well, if you say no, we're going to cut the grant. Because we've been good to you, you're not good to us. Take your grant, take your visa, and stick it on your head. I'll pray for the government. Because government are, are people. I'll pray for them. But you come and force upon me evil deeds, I'll put it under my foot and I'll step on it in Jesus' mighty name. I don't need you. I need the Lord. We put our trust in the Lord, not in a government. It is not the government that created me. It is not the government that brought me into existence. It is not the government that has provided for me. Everything is from God. And if they turn my other cheek, I will call my daddy to teach this government a lesson to know there is God in heaven. You're not. So better not act as God. They think when I talk like that, I'm showing off. I'm not. I have a phone direct to my Lord Jesus. I can teach Australia, America, Canada, China, everyone. One phone call. But the problem is the church. This landowner had a vineyard, church. The owner is Christ. The church is that vineyard. He put a fence around it, his law. The Holy Bible is his law. He said that to the church, abide by my word. Let my word be your strength. And then he put a wine press in that vineyard. Wine press is the holy altar, his body and blood. The strength of the church is the body and the blood. Satan, please open your ears. Believe me, Satan now is eating hot Indian pepper because I'm talking this way about him. He's on fire. I can see him. He wants to come and, and shut, shred me. Uh, be gone. Okay? I have my Jesus. So get lost, Satan. He, Satan will do anything and everything for you to let go of the body and the blood of Christ. He will let you sing for him until kingdom comes. He will let you preach for him until kingdom comes. He will let you come to church until kingdom comes, as long as you don't receive the body and the blood. Because the only thing that burnt him, that crushed his head, was the body and the blood. The only thing. You take the body and the blood out of the church, kiss that church goodbye. Satan is playing soccer in that church. Believe you me. Believe I don't care how many times you shout. Without the body and the blood, you are dead. Dead. It is not my word. It is the Lord's. He who takes my body and drinks of my blood lives in me forever. But he who does not receive my body and blood, he has no life in him. No life. No life. He'll give you anything and everything as long as he takes you away from the body and the blood. The church has gone to sleep for quite some time, needs to wake up. And I'm talking about the apostolic church, either Catholic or Orthodox, need to wake up. You need to speak about the Lord with fire, Holy Spirit. You need to engulf the whole world for the Lord Jesus. You have the sacraments. You have the Holy Spirit working. Why are you gone to sleep? Because the apostolic church seeked 
Thrones, not Christ. Thrones, not Christ. Limousines, not walking barefooted. We lived in high places. We did not humble ourselves. Why should I as a bishop sit in a limo? Why should I as a bishop walk on red carpets? Why should I as a bishop have bodyguards? Why should I as a bishop live in a mansion and have millions upon millions upon millions? For what? For what? For what? For what? There are millions of people dying, starving in the street. If anything, I need to take my clothes off and put it on that naked person. If I truly seek the Lord Jesus. When Great Britain was in India, enslaving the Indians, Gandhi, who was a Hindu, a Hindu, a non-believer in Jesus Christ, a Hindu. When he came and saw the icon of the Lord Jesus nailed on the cross, cr the crucified Jesus. When he looked at the Lord on the cross, he said this beautiful statement. He said, give me the Christ and away the Christians. I don't want the Christians, I want the Christ. Because the Christians, Great Britain is known to be Christian to the world. He said, the Christians have enslaved me. Jesus wouldn't have done this. Jesus came to set me free. Yet you call yourself Christians, walking in the footprints of Christ. Yet look at you enslaving people. Get away, you Christians. I want the Christ. The Christ loves me. You don't. We need the church to go back to her glorious days, Ephesus. And the word Ephesus derives from the Greek word meaning the beloved. Today we are living Laodicea, the rebellious church. But Ephesus was beloved, why? Because Simon Peter, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, James, John, all of them were humble. None of them had mansions. None of them had limousines. None of, them, none of them were dressed up in linen and gold and walking in cathedrals built out of marbles, stone, precious stones, silver, gold, and, and diamonds. None of them. They walked barefooted in the streets. And if you looked at Simon Peter, you would have mistaken him by a street beggar. He was this kind of a look on him, a street beggar. But this street beggar raised the dead and changed the world. Where are those leaders? Today, if there is a little spot here on, the, on my outfit, oh, oh, I want it clean. It's too dirty, I can't wear it. Get a life, get a shovel and go and dig, man. Now if I'm given a chance, I'll make them all work for the doll. <laughs> go and clean the streets of Fairfield. Bishops, cardinals, yalla, let's go. Get the broom and get the shovel and let's go and clean the streets. But before you clean the streets, let's go and clean people for Christ. Church needs to be strong. And he put a tower in that vineyard. The tower is God himself, the Lord Jesus. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The tower is God. You know why? Because when you go up there, you can see the enemy coming from a long, far away. The tower is to watch for the enemy movement. And the tower is God. When you are instilled, embedded in God, you will see the movement of the enemy. You will know who is right and who is wrong, where the light is and where darkness is. Because when you are in Christ, Christ will reveal to you everything 
everything. We need to come to the Lord with humility. There is one God that has created everything visible and invisible, the physical and the spiritual realms. This is the truth. Forget about Bing Bang and gorillas. He didn't come from an ape. Stop this nonsense. Darwin's theory, evolution, he can stick it on his forehead and on that round table where he was a member of these evildoers. And I'll leave Great Britain to elaborate on what the round table was all about. Because it's their invention. There was members on the, in that round table. All of them atheists took the core hating the Lord Jesus. Not anyone else. Not Islam, not Buddhism, no, 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 no. They were deliberate against the Lord. Why? Because Satan only hates the Lord Jesus. He doesn't give one penny about the others. Because there is only one who crushed his head. And that's why he's furious. He's fuming. I can't believe I was defeated by this man called Jesus. That's why he can't stand Jesus. And he will fight against everyone who proclaims Jesus as their Lord and Savior. All the round table members, atheists to the core, hating the Lord. One of their agenda was to reduce the world's population. It's, uh, what's his name? Bill Gates. Ah, Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill Gates is just part of it. It's nothing. It's just a little toy. When he expires, he's just going to disappear. He disappeared already, I don't know. Do you hear of him? Nothing. Bill Gates coming in the 21st century, we need to, who do you think you are? This was already discussed in the round table centuries before you. Yeah? Reduce world's population. Ash on your head. God is the only one. Until he speaks, nothing happens. I pray, not for anything. Huh? I don't care, they come kill me, they do whatever. Please do me a favor. I don't, I don't want this world. I, just, I can't wait to leave. I can't wait to be with my Lord. You can kill the body, you can't kill the spirit, you little kids. Right? So you'll do me a favor. But I pray the Lord Jesus on this holy Sunday to plug Satan from his roots and all his foul spirits and every evil doer, every human being that is following Satan, worshiping Satan and doing Satan's work I pray the Lord decimate them all and teach them a lesson that there is only one God who art in heaven and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How dare you try to be God, you little piece of dust. May every evil agenda be put to shame. May every evil agenda be put to shame. May every evil agenda be put to shame. And may every church leader, their heads to be bowed before the feet of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For his head needs to be seen. And none of us, none of us, none of us. Because there is only one head to the church. And that head definitely is not the Pope, not the Patriarch. It is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get it through your thick heads. Enough. Shame on us Christians. We can't even unite the calendar for Sunday resurrection. When are we going to unite with our canonical laws and theological indifferences? When? Shame on us. This landowner had a vineyard. The church is the Lord's. It's not the Pope. It's the Lord's. We 
can't even unite the Sunday resurrection. They tried to change the Sunday to be neither Orthodox date nor Catholic, as if it's theirs. Do you think the Catholic rose from the dead or the Orthodox? Seriously. Is the sepulchre church the Catholics or the Orthodox? It's the Lord's, you fools. It's the Lord's. You ignorance. The holy fire is the Lord's. It's not Orthodox. It's the Lord's. The tomb is the Lord's. It's, that's why it's empty. Our one is full of termites and rotted bones. It's the Lord's that is empty because he is the only one as a human being that is sinless, perfect as God. It's the Lord's enough. You want to unite? Come where the holy fire appears and unite that date. That is the Lord. The holy fire has been coming out of that tomb for the last 2023 years. And in a few more weeks, it will come again in 2024. Without fail, it's the Lord. Who cares about Catholic Orthodox? Who cares? It's the Lord. Unite for the sake of the Lord. Why you are we are not? Because we lack humility. And we lack true love. That's why. Humility and love are missing. I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm just shouting for the Lord. If there is anyone who is a sinner is me, believe you me, believe you me. I'm shouting to receive the mercy of the Lord because without him, I'm dead. Without him, I'm lost. Without him, I'm blind. Without him, I'm weak. Without him, I'm nothing. I'm shouting for the Lord to have mercy on me because I need him. He is my life. My everything, my everything, my everything. Young men and young women, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, grandparents, grandfather and grandmother. Without the Lord, all of us are nothing. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. Give the Lord. Amen. Amen. A skinny guy said to the fat guy, What's going down, brother? The fat guy replied and said everything. <laughs> That's why I'm fat. And I just, I've run out of jokes. I'll, um, this is a repeated one about a hundred million times. I'll say it again. <laughs> this husband, now wives, please be careful, huh? Please pay attention. This husband, used, he named his wife, my life. That was her name. My life, good morning. My life, how are you? My life, let's go. My life, come. My life, my life, my life, my life, my life. One night they were asleep. The husband wakes up startled. He sensed there was something in the room. And as he, woke, as he wakes up startled, he sees the angel of God standing before him. He said, Kiriya Leison, Lord have mercy. Angel, what is it? He said, I came to take your life. He said, here she is. <laughs> you see, after all, men are not that dumb. They can get you back when it really counts take her baby she is my life <laughs> oh my goodness I'm crying love the Lord amen let's bow our heads in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit one God amen 
our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes, and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace, and instill the walks of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you always, my beloved. Um, just a couple of announcements very quickly. Um, for those who are still um, going through um, the Great Lent, which is uh, mainly the Orthodox, the Christian Orthodox that are left. All the others have celebrated the Sunday Resurrection and <laughs> finished now. They're all eating steak and uh, chocolate. And I'm going, oh... I'm anyway, I'm vegetarian, so that doesn't matter, I don't eat meat. Okay, so um, for those who are still going through the Great Lent, I'd uh, just like to, would, to say, in our church, we have three main weeks of the entire Great Lent. The first week, the middle week, and the last week. So we've decided um, in those weeks, we not decided, but in those weeks, there are Holy Mass services every day. Uh, because of uh, certain other activities that we have in the church, so we've allocated Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of that week where we celebrate the Holy Mass service every single day. So, Tuesday the 9th of April, Wednesday the 10th of April, and Thursday the 11th of April. In those three days, every single evening, there is the Holy Mass service at 6.30 p.m. Every evening, 6.30 p.m. Tuesday the 9th of April, 6.30 p.m. Mass. Wednesday, 10th of April, 6.30 p.m and Thursday, 11th of April, 6.30 p.m., Holy Mass service. We have a tradition in our church um, in the middle of the Great Lent, which happens to be the 10th of April, which we call it Mid-Lent. We have a tradition in our church. What do we do? We put mashed potato in a bun, and there is one cross made out of wood, little tiny cross with wood, we put that one cross in one of those many buns. So when you come and you take one before you eat it, lest be that cross in it and then it ch chokes you up, you need to open it and go through that mashed potato hoping the cross is there because you'll receive a golden cross in place. It's a tradition. And there is a, a reason of this tradition. It's not just out of thin air, it's biblical. And we'll explain it when you come on the 10th of April. <laughs> All right? So we do that every single year. It's called Mid-Lent. So you'll get a bun with mashed potato, go through it, make sure. Last year, actually, I, I, I got the cross. I honestly, I... <laughs> and ever since I've been copping it badly. <laughs> I said, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> He said, you got the cross. <laughs> I thought I was a great blessing. He said, yeah, it's a blessing and a smacking as well. <laughs> so I said, thank you, Lord Jesus. I'll fix you up when I see you next time. <laughs> um, I, love, I love him so much. I just, I don't know. I love him so much. And I love him. But I have to watch what I say, otherwise uh, I'll be theologically incorrect. <laughs> I'll go to Jesus, goody, goody, goody. <laughs> Was that theologically incorrect? <laughs> or is it, 
if I carry him as a baby is my wish. Is that theologically incorrect? What's it to you? <laughs> I'll ask my mom to give me her son as a baby. The Holy Mother is amazing. The Holy Mother is amazing. Ask for her help, for her intercession. Believe me. Believe me, ask. Jesus Christ is the Savior. The Holy Mother takes me to the Savior. She knows how to take me to the Savior. She knows him more than everyone else. More than everyone. She knows him. Not because she is his mom only, but because she did the will of God. So faithfully. And so honorably. That's why the Lord loves her. He loves her for doing the will of God more than being his mom only. She is the reason why I'm still standing physically. She is the reason why I'm still standing physically. No one can tell me Mary is not living and she doesn't hear me and doesn't pray for me. She came. What, are you going to tell me she didn't? Come on. Man. I know. She showed me that. Her son showed me that. Her son. Her son. Who is God? Yeah? Oh, yeah, her son is God, yes. Okay. So you can call her the mother of God. It's okay. You know hard feelings. And you can call her the mother of Christ. Please relax. Because Christ is God revealed in the flesh. And she is the mother of the word incarnate who is Christ at the end of the day, God revealed in the flesh. But she came. She's amazing. And the, her beauty, pff, stunning. And definitely she's still living. And she will live forever. What did? We're dead. They're, they're, they're living up there. We're the dead on earth. It's the other way around. Please, don't mix it and don't confuse it. So the 10th of April, you'll get a mashed potato baby <laughs> with a cross in it. Hopefully it's going to be your portion. Um, washing of the, uh, the feet of the disciples, the Sunday school divine heart, they told us that there is only two spots left. Mom and dad, if you have a son that is between the ages of 7 and 16, we need two more boys. Two more boys uh, to have 12 disciples to wash their feet.